Hey, everybody. Look, this is a talk in the attic, and it's going to be a podcast that will rely heavily on its guest's willingness to, to open up and to really talk to me. And of course, my ability to facilitate that person opening up too. I've always been less interested in plot than I have been in characters. And so really the aim of this project is going to understand, is, is really to understand the men and women behind the stories so that our listeners might find, you know, something out about themselves along the way. In 2013, I participated in a personal development program called Praxis. And it was a, it was a workplace curriculum, which was really focused on, I suppose, the, the truism uh, that a professional leader cannot excel on the outside until that leader takes care of what's happening on the inside, right? Makes sense. Uh, personal trust had to be attained before organizational trust was to follow. And Lamont Moon, the creator of this program, was a quirky guy, and I mean quirky. But his perspectives did help me understand a new way of thinking that up until that point, you know, 25, 26 years old, I hadn't considered. And I'll always be indebted to Lamont for that reason. Um, he, he asserted something that I reflect on probably on a daily basis, near daily basis. And that is that before anyone is going to trust you, you'll first have to offer a showing of trust to that person. You know, I remember him warning us, don't be reckless about it, but, but open yourself up a little bit at a time and, and you can kind of evaluate that person's trustworthiness. And, and meanwhile, they'll be opening themselves up in the same way and likely evaluating you. I remember him exc exclaiming, surely you can't expect that someone will share their true selves with you if you aren't willing to provide a window into yours. And it, he's, it's right. He was absolutely right. And surely he, he was right about cautioning against throwing our trust to just anyone as well. But he was correct in his primary point, which put simply is to be trusted, you must first trust. And so in the spirit of that lesson and that kind of value that I have, I'm bringing to you today this introductory episode of the talk in the attic which in this one instance and only in this one instance will be about me your host kirk ross and just like we talked about this is me trusting you first and hopefully in return i'll, I'll get some of your trust and over time i think we'll continue to, to be able to build a relationship and i think we'll get along famously so let's do the damn thing Okay, so how did I, Kirk Ross, end up sitting alone at this makeshift recording studio in my house in Grand Rapids, Michigan on a, a Wednesday morning, talking into a microphone with no audience, I, I suppose an audience that closely resembles my, my roster at Family Christmas, right? Well, let's get into it. So trivial shit first. I was born in 1984 in Bay City, Michigan, and I was the third ch child of two loving Midwestern parents, and I'll save you the math, I'm 35 years old. I have a brother, Justin, and a sister, Jesse, eight years and six years older than me, respectively, um, making me, I guess, what I've heard referred to before as a second firstborn, right? So, you know, because I was six years younger than my nearest sibling, I got a lot of attention from my parents, who were pretty well-established as parents by that point. Uh, my siblings were nice to me. They viewed me as a little kid, not really as a rival, and so... You know, no inner sibling rivalry and attentive parents in a safe Midwestern town? Fucking jackpot, right? And it really was. I mean, academics came easy for me. I was naturally coordinated, so sports came relatively easy. Um, I'd spent a lot of time with my older siblings, and so social situations were, and confidence kind of were already within me. Um, and then through sports and through academics, you know, we were able to form a really tight-knit friendship group, which... Frankly, over 25 plus years has held together surprisingly well since we first joined forces, for sure. We still get together. So, you know, I had, by all accounts, an excellent middle class upbringing. You know, and I hope some of you listening right now may, you know, I've had uh, struggles growing up, major struggles. And I hope that the beginning of my story doesn't turn you off. I think that as you learn a little bit more about me, you'll see that we probably have more in common than you think. You know, I mean, growing up, I really never felt any overt pressure to participate in sports. It, it was certainly the path that presented itself most obviously. I mean, my parents were athletes. My uh, siblings were very strong athletes. And, 
you know, the other thing is my parents were involved in the organization of the sports league. So granted, you know, I was a tall athletic kid and it was sports, go sports, right? You know, and I, and I owe a lot to organized sports. I mean, it allowed me the opportunity to spend a ton of time with my dad because he, he was commonly coaching us. Um, I met most of my then and, and really current friends through it. You know, it, it also developed in me a fierce competitiveness, which that's something that's proven largely beneficial, but at times harmful throughout my life too. You know, I mean, my desire to c compete and to win has certainly helped me with professional success, and it's probably at the heart of my ability to, to execute plans. But, but in my earlier adult life, I, I think my competitiveness likely led to the disregard of people's feelings at times. Um, you know, if, if winning is everything, then how could I possibly have time to consider the wake of the personal baggage that I was generating behind the W's? You know, we'll talk about this a little bit later, too. But realistically, in my heart, I think I've, I've always been a creative, you know, but I was too afraid to act on it. You know, this tall, white, straight Midwestern student athlete didn't put energy into the arts. Like what? I'm going to try out for the plays and the musicals and, and what? Miss baseball practice? You know, and, and at the time, I, I, I can say with certainty that I had no idea that, that I was following some path based on some desired image that I aspired to portray. Um, I was just kind of doing and going along with what you do. You know, I, I started chasing a, a female classmate, like, aggressively until she finally agreed to be my girlfriend. And, and ultimately, she became my wife, my, my first wife, that is. Um, and, and she was and still is a wonderful person, but we lacked uh, true compatibility, which, frankly, I knew long before I even asked her to marry me. You know, and it sounds crazy, but you heard it right. I knew we were a bad match before I even proposed. So... Why would I have proceeded like that, right? And I, who knows? But after years of reflection, I, I think I can say probably with certainty that my, my primary concern all those years was my image. And breaking up with her after five years of dating would have made me the bad guy. It, it would have made me the guy who couldn't really see a relationship through. I also think that my competitiveness led to the erroneous or you know, ill-fated perception that she was simply a conquest to me and not really a unique person with her own set of strengths and weaknesses and, and, and goals, etc. You know, we both got jobs after college. We bought a house. We got a dog. What's up, Rocco? Long time no see. We got married. And as a friend once put it, house, dog, wedding? You're 2.1 kids away from the American dream. But inside, I, I wasn't living the American dream. I, I felt guilty for not being into my then wife. I felt guilty for pouring my life into my job rather than addressing what really needed to be addressed at home. And, and while this did yield excellent professional results for me, resulting in promotions and, and the opportunity to work with some really smart, excellent people and the ability to travel to Japan pretty much as I wanted, met some great friends. But frankly, discussing technical designs for auto-dimming rearview mirrors with middle-aged uh, Japanese men for 12 fucking hours a day, what, not only was it preventing me from addressing the failed relationship, but it also was zapping me of any sort of creative nature that, you know, frankly, looking back, was probably just pounding at the inside of my chest to get to come out, you know, and to be expressed. And so I did what, what numerous, what most everyone does uh, in situations like this, and I used numbing agents to, to hide it all and to avoid it. You know, I drank more than I should have. I got obsessive about exercise and running. I began some inappropriate relationships. I, I mean, these are complete dick moves, I know. You know, but look, by the, by the time I was 28 years old and after three years of marriage, I was a divorcee. And this was difficult on my ego, really difficult, which at this point had become much larger than I had realized, you know, at the time. I, I had a hard time looking my friends and family in the eye. I had, I had times even looking myself in the mirror at times. Um, my, my mind raced with so many thoughts, almost on a constant basis. And I'm not looking for sympathy. I was selfish and I was paying accordingly and it was accordingly and it was a needed lesson indeed, you know. I mean, I, I, the, the crazy thing is that I really wasn't honest with anyone about what had really happened. I mean, not even myself. I mean, at the time, I wasn't even aware of what had really happened. You know, and so now here I am, having never really been single. I enter the dating scene with an ego and without taking any time whatsoever to figure myself out. Like rush right on in. That was kind of my motto. Like, what am I going to fucking dwell forever, you know? And so at this point, rather than avoiding my inner turmoil, I simply kind of forged ahead with my, my expert uh, level of avoidance, this time using dating as the excuse. 
And within a few months, I had met a new girl, much younger and from an exotic, entirely different cultural background as me. Um, and this was exciting and fun for me. But, but looking back now, I think the, the real reason I was drawn into this relationship is, is because I, I thought that, the image would benef- that my image would benefit greatly from it. You know, again, I didn't know this at the time. I'm saying this now. But, you know, reflection and time are, are powerful tools. But I, I remember thinking, wow, Kirk is with somebody different and, and from a different country. He's so open-minded. He just needed a change of pace from white suburbia. Cool. You know, and I had started at a new company as well, seeking more money and greener pastures from my previous place. And, and frankly, at this new place, nobody knew about my failed marriage. So that's great for the image, right? You know, I was making good money. I was making major strides towards landing new business at this new company, getting high-level attention from high-level people. But just 10 months from my separation from my first wife, I was engaged again. 10 months, engaged again. This time, the expectation of the diamond size had doubled or more, you know, which could have been a red flag, but I was happy to oblige. Wow, hey, Kirk, that new sales guy bought his young fiance a $15,000 ring. Cool. You know, but realistically, this entire relationship was built on shaky ground. I hadn't really been ready to start something serious. She hadn't been either. We got married a couple years later. It was a fucking mess looking back. I mean, we had entirely different dispositions, entirely different goals, entirely different perspectives on almost everything. I I believe I was manipulated throughout the relationship too, but that's that's my fault as well. You know, I, I share in the responsibility and accountability on that as well. Once again, however I got there, The reality was I hated where I was at. And once again, numbing agents were there to help avoid the issue, right? And while I'd always remained faithful in this case, I wasn't always fully honest with her either. You know, we tried marriage counseling. That really didn't yield anything. And eight months after getting married for the second time, my second marriage was effectively over. You know, and and honestly, this one banged me up a lot more. I wasn't calling the shots in this situation like I had been the first go around. And I wasn't quite aware yet that the entire relationship was bullshit the whole time either. Plus, my image was hurt. You know, it really was, but I was hurt too. I started partying more, and and as as often as the case, alcohol sometimes needs a companion to level you out and keep you productive and keep you going. And and since I had money, there really wasn't any limitation to what I had access to in terms of partying. You know, and, and maybe my concern over image yielded somewhat of a positive result here because... I always kept my parting at least somewhat in check in order to avoid the perceptions that would come with like the rock star image, right? And I, the other thing keeping me somewhat in line was that I was very much still interested in my work, which required focus and, and real effort. So, so now I know that I was really struggling with depression and anxiety, but then I thought I was just really tired and, and really hungry, and for some reason all of my clothes started shrinking at the same fucking time. And before I knew it, I was a fucking fat sales guy Uh, working for a company who didn't really value the same things I did, spending my hefty salary on distractions and Uber Eats. You know, and around the same time, my professional mentor and and direct boss left the company to help his father through some health troubles back in New Zealand where he was from, and that was devastating as well. James was was my six foot five Kiwi boss who was an outsider in a family company as well. He valued aggressiveness and results. Uh, He would change his mind with me and actually talk to me and it might get spirited, but at the end of it, we would come out with what we think was the right decision. Fucking A, he was funny as shit. Uh, he, he really understood what it was like to try to fit into this uh, culture that really wasn't susceptible to change, and, and it wasn't susceptible to t- change by design. So his departure was really difficult for me. Especially at going on, what was going on at home, I really needed a, a strong mentor to keep me on track as I struggled with what was going on there. And someone who maybe I could be open-minded, who I could, you know, discuss with, with an open mind without any fear of judgment. You know, and really calling my parents wasn't an option. I mean, maybe it was in reality, but at the time I didn't think of it as one. You know, we hadn't really ever discussed mental health or, or coping strategies or really negative struggle type stuff at all, really. And I'm not sure if that's a Midwest thing or, or, or a generational thing or maybe a Ross family thing, you know. Or perhaps it isn't a thing and they would have welcomed the conversation and attempted lovingly and awkwardly to help me see things differently. And I should have tried them, you know, looking back. I really should have. But I really didn't even discuss these feelings that I was having with anyone, not even like my tightest friends, not even really with myself. I went to a psychologist, but I wasn't really fully open there. We ended up just being friendly. And 
you know, while I didn't get as much out of that as I, I could have had I really opened up, it still was valuable for me. You know, he provided me an ear to talk into and gave me some of my confidence back, but I, I should have given more of myself to him as well. You know, the next 15 months were a complete blur. You know, I, I wasn't going all in to work on myself. I was working on myself a little bit. I mean, I learned a little bit about meditation and, and love languages, and I learned a little bit about some personality traits. I sought to, to find my personal blind spots so that I could know myself and maybe know how other people perceive me a little bit better. But I was still eating terribly, partying way too much, and when it comes down to it, it was making me negative. You know, my historically positive disposition were completely poisoned with like doubt and anger and guilt. And I knew I had more in me. I knew it. And yet I knew I was wasting it too. And maybe, at least for me personally, nothing creates guilt more like wasted potential. And I was absolutely wasting mine. I had come to dislike a lot about my company, a lot of, a lot of that for a reason and with reason, but, but that was no longer a positive refuge for me. I was single. I wasn't really keeping in touch with my, my awesome friends or my excellent family. I was stuck at best. And honestly, more likely, I was probably fucking heading in the wrong direction. Like, something's got to give, right? Please, something, give. Oh, something gave all right, a bunch of things, okay? A childhood friend of mine, Jessica, with, you know, who I had kept kind of in touch with over the years. Um, she was a childhood crush of mine, and then we kind of, uh, hung out a little bit in between my marriages, um, you know, but we kept in touch sparsely throughout the years, but she reached out to me via Facebook on New Year's Eve 2018, so, so uh, December 31st, 2017, and I straight up missed it. Okay, so fast forward now to August of 2018, and I noticed it for the first time, and I replied, and, and what's about to transpire is the first of a number of developments that will transpire over a very short period of time that have been extremely impactful for me. You know, Jessica's message, original message from New Year's Eve said something like, Happy New Year, Kirk. Uh, cheers to new beginnings or something really sweet like that. To which seven months later, I replied, uh, send nudes, please. You know, just a classic love story beginning. No, no, I'm kidding. But I wrote back apologizing for the lengthy delay, of course, and, and asking how she was. And almost instantly with her, I felt something different. Like I felt comfortable. I felt open. And because Jessica and I had already known each other at least a little bit, there was already uh, some trust established, I think something that both of us were craving after uh, years of shitty experiences, right? And we chatted and chatted via Facebook. We, we, for hours and hours, we talked on the phone, which is an uncommon thing for us both. Um, we shared all the shitty things that have happened to us, all the good stuff. We discussed the old times, uh, the hanky-panky that we participated in in mid-Michigan back in the late 90s. You know, and it, at the end of it, all culminated in this immediate desire. I needed to see her. Right, I had to see her, but I also needed to schedule out a little bit uh, time so I could take care of some housekeeping items. You know, I mean, namely, like drop some lbs, clean my apartment, manscape, maybe those three things. I guess you could call those like the single guy, like holy trinity. Uh, but we did put a date on the schedule, and she was set to come out to see me in Grand Rapids a few weeks later. Uh, something certainly to look forward to, and we continued to talk throughout that time as well. Um, chatting and, and talking on the phone, and as you can imagine, I was looking forward to this beautiful, sexy powerful lawyer to come out and stay with me. And, and I had, you know, let's face it, I had very primal motivations at first, okay? But as we continued to chat leading up to the rendezvous, I began to understand Jessica as a person and really see her for that as the first time, I think. And it was nice. Now, my main focus still remained on her physical beauty and how I might uh, exploit that into my favor. But, but I was starting to kind of turn on, on what, what this person was. She was a person and she was unique. Um, and so three days out from the big reunion, you know, the, the single guy, Holy Trinity, is in full effect. So I'm driving home from the gym and maybe even the tanner or something. <laughs> uh, when I received a call from my mom and my 41-year-old brother, Justin, and frankly, my closest confidant, had just suffered a major heart attack. And the information was highly limited at the time, just enough to make me tremble and, and shake uncontrollably to the point where I like pulled off to the side of the road in order to prevent me from you know, driving in the fucking Grand River. Um, and, and so I hung up with my mom and I, I immediately called Justin's wife, Mandy, who, you know, I imagine had the most information and she certainly did, but her iPhone was nearing the end of its battery life. And it became very clear very quickly at this point that it could be it for Justin. Uh, Mandy was sitting in the ambulance and they were, 
they were rushing him the near 40 miles to Grand Rapids from his hometown. And um, as I began to hear the high pitch, like tone of a flatliner, Mandy said something like, oh shit, uh, something just happened. And then her phone died. I called Jessica next and let her know. Uh, obviously I was very shaken up and she was highly like genuinely concerned. That was immediately evident. And that was honestly a big moment for me because she proved then, even though I, I didn't necessarily know that this is what I was hoping for, but that she was interested in the real me, you know, even kind of the, the bummer parts of it, right? And anyway, I knew where the ambulance was headed, only about a mile from my apartment. So, so I stopped home, I got changed real quick, and ended up going up to the Meyer Heart Center where uh, Justin was undergoing emergency surgery. And, you know, I found Mandy sitting in an empty waiting room. She, she did seem more relaxed now than she had on the phone. So I took that as a sign that her outlook was probably more hopeful now. Um, we talked and we joked a little and we did whatever we could to pass the time, which, by the way, was crawling by at a fucking glacial pace, as I'm sure some of you can have experienced. Um, but within about 45 minutes, I would say, uh, the surgery was complete. He had a stent placed and Justin was awake. Uh, it turns out that he had like near complete blockage in his widowmaker artery. Uh, the name of which probably gives away just how serious it was and really just how lucky we all were to have our brother and our son and, and husband and dad still with us. I was beyond relieved that he was still alive, that his wife and kids could still have him around, that I could still talk to him about music and life with him, that maybe I would take him bowling occasionally and beat him by 100 or 120 pins. I mean, that's not an easy guy to replace for me. Most people are much better than him at bowling. And through Justin's experience... I learned, though, that life can end on a dime in a second, that your health isn't to be trifled with, don't take it for granted, and that really a slight shift in, pers in perspective can yield enormous impact. You know, the shitty leadership decisions at work seemed irrelevant now. My divorces and how other people might per perceive that were fucking trivial. You know, Justin was alive and that was all that mattered. But he was never an expert on timing, though, and once he was out of the woods... You know, I started to revert back to my, my feelings about Jessica, and I really feared that the whole ordeal might have disrupted her trip out here. Uh, but it didn't. I assured her that medical emergencies weren't part of our family's modus operandi, you know, but that I did understand if she wanted to reschedule. And in retrospect, that might have been my final effort to kind of keep her away so I could, quote-unquote, get ready, you know, for her to come. But the truth was, it didn't matter to Jessica. She was ready to come see me right when we started clicking. And, and this fact simply deepened my comfort level with her. So Justin's good. He's in, he's in recovery. Let's shift gears back now to the, to the weekend of August 24th, 2018. And Jessica was set to come to my apartment that night. It was a Friday night. She texted two or three different ETAs throughout her road trip over, uh, each one a little bit later than the other one. So I don't know if they were making frequent stops or what, but... Um, you know, the reality was this was a little bit more time for me to squeeze in some fucking push-ups and a couple sit-ups, maybe change my shirt again. You know, maybe this one won't make me look as chubby. But as her ETA started to coincide with the current time, of course, I, I panicked completely. I mean, up until this point, <clears throat> I had failed to make any plans whatsoever for us. You know, she was going to be in Grand Rapids and we were going to hang out, right? Well, then I started thinking, shit, what if we don't click? We got to do something. So I started searching the various websites, Facebook for for events around Grand Rapids that week. There was a large music festival going down, which I had never even heard of, called Breakaway. We are now big fans of this festival, but at this time we didn't know about it. And I scooped up two VIP tickets for the Saturday, and I'm thinking, okay, worst case, if we don't click, at least we're going to watch some fun music and we'll probably have a fun day, right? Well, we clicked. And we clicked in such a profound way that like, I'm not going to even attempt to articulate it here. Okay, Jessica was different. She didn't care about other people's perceptions of her. She was purely authentic, and I mean genuinely, real, really authentic, even when it didn't align with her surroundings. And she was kind in a truer sense of the world. In the uh, truer sense of the word, I mean, she was less concerned so much about acting nice as she was about really listening, giving real feedback, and that's what real kindness is. I've learned. You know, she was positive about herself, about me, about everything. She was open, too. I learned a lot about her personal struggles that I never knew, and I learned about her, some of her successes. But we spent the bulk of the weekend just walking around the city, soaking up the sun. It was a beautiful weekend in, in late August in Michigan, and uh, we just learned about each other. And for me, I was learning about myself, too. So on Sunday, the final day of this, this weekend trip, uh, Jessica and I had time for one final you know, walkabout before, before her ride was coming to pick her up and get her back to Bay City. It was warm that day, probably like 85, with a really, <clears throat> really nice breeze, okay? And I remember the conditions so well because 
I'll never forget the feeling that I had when, when she and I kind of hugged each other and kissed right in front of my apartment, right before she had to go get in her car and take off for the, for the night. Um, and for the first time in my adult life, and, and really maybe my whole life, my brain went quiet. My anxiety is silenced completely. And as we stood there and kissed, my brain did its typical anxiety routine of searching for all the possible negative outcomes available to this, to this scenario. And I couldn't find it. I would check again. Are you sure? Nothing. And, and as I searched for the reasons why this can't work, my mind went completely quiet. And I was truly present. I really believe this is so profound. For the first time ever, I was truly present. And the city sounds that I love so much kind of disappeared. It, it became silent. It felt like we were standing on a private beach in the middle of nowhere, not on a street corner in, in one of the busiest towns in Michigan. And to this day, I've never felt a more profound sensation or really realized anything that I consider more elementarily requisite for my personal growth. You know, in my newfound psychological silence, I learned that A, I suffered from severe anxiety without having known it, and that B, I could silence it. At least when I was with Jessica, I could silence it. So I knew right then and right there that I absolutely found my person. I mean, sure, I had known Jess all along, but we really had just recently rediscovered each other. And this time, maybe we knew ourselves well enough to, to finally get to know and to love someone else. And that, that night, that Sunday night after our weekend rendezvous was the, was the first of just two total nights that we've spent, spent apart since. I'm not saying that in any sort of way other than that we're both very happy about that. And the next day, I remember I, after work, I drove to Bay City, which is where we're both from, to see her digs. You know, I went to hang out there and get a feel for her life a little bit. And we've spent all but one night together ever since. So let's, let's bring it on. So as we continue to fall in love, you know, I had a lingering health concern to tend to, particularly coming off the heels of my brother's recent brush with, with death, frankly. And so the week following my magical whirlwind of love, I had something that happened that brought me back to earth pretty quickly. And I think life, life has a way of doing that as long as you're paying attention to it. You know, you're, it's kind of always steady. So my annual physical that year had presented some serious concerns over my liver and kidney health, and really without any obvious cause. Uh, my doctor was harsh with me, which was difficult at first, but I came to appreciate it. And he, he told me that he's concerned about it and that I should be too. He told me that lifestyle changes were coming and they weren't optional. And so for the next three months, I was to abstain from alcohol, which frankly was perfect for me because I'd been searching uh, for a reason to limit my drinking. I'd wanted to, and this kind of gave me a perfect excuse, uh, excuse as to why I had to abstain, right? Despite the concern over exactly what was going on, I loved how great I felt from cutting out the booze. I mean, I lost significant weight, like 35 pounds. My skin looked better. I felt more positive. I felt less guilty. And frankly, Jessica isn't really a big drinker anyway, so this brought us closer together. It allowed us to, to be more active more, com more often, and we remained positive together. We weren't ever hung over. We remembered everything about each other. And really, it only took a, maybe a week or even less to forget about alcohol altogether. And, and now we're about 16 or 18 months later, and I have remained off the sauce, you know, off the shitty food that comes with drinking, off the lazy days of being too hungover to produce at the level that I want to produce. You know, and if any of you are considering taking a break from alcohol, I strongly urge you to give it a try, even if it's just for a few weeks, because, you know, first off, let me note here that I enjoy marijuana regularly. Uh, so no judgment for me, whatever you want to do. In fact, Jessica and I met a valet guy at a hotel in Nashville once who had recently quit drinking and he relies on the devil's lettuce as well to stay sane. And he called it the high and dry plan, which has always stuck with me. So I'm a big believer in the high and dry plan. But anyway, my, my liver health was deemed okay ultimately with a fatty liver diagnosis that really could be managed through simple lifestyle changes. And I'd already begun those lifestyle changes, so really no skin off my back. And my long-term prescription from the doc was basically as awesome as I could have hoped to have received, right? I, had, I was to drink more coffee eat sunflower seeds, reduce alcohol, and exercise. Well, okay, that's not so bad. And as you can imagine, Jessica was right by my side as I went through the, the waffling process of, oh, I'm going to be fine, to, oh, I probably have cancer, to, oh, my God, I'm almost certainly going to die, you know, but then ultimately making it through. She always treated my concerns with respect, with love. You know, she helped me feel positive without dismissing my concerns. Um, and, and it was completely clear at this point that Jessica absolutely had to be my wife. And it was clear to me that she felt the same way. And so I got the thinking in my head, at least, about how I might make that happen. Uh, really without concern for how folks might react to me. 
a then 33-year-old man tying the knot for the third time. You know, and this time even after the shortest courtship yet. So what am I, fucking Larry King here? Now, just to ensure that I didn't forget about all the yin to this positive gain coming my way, I was served with yet another medical surprise, this time at the expense of my dad, who up until this point had been really as healthy as a, a mid-60-year-old man could be. Um, but th in this case, his large intestine ruptured, which kind of releases toxic bacteria into his body, and that can go lethal extremely quickly. And he was touch and go for a night or two, and he ultimately pulled through just fine. But, but my dad's experience reminded me uh, what I had really just learned th through Justin not long before, right? That your health can turn quickly, that your loved ones can pass away in the blink of an eye, and that the whole fucking thing is, is fragile. You know, I shed a lot of tears throughout both of those two experiences, my dad and my brother. But ultimately, these were undoubtedly positive experiences for my personal growth, uh, you know, for keeping me grounded to reality and really for teaching me how to love and to be more open. Had either my brother or father passed away, he would have moved on without really having known me. I mean, the real me, like how I think and, and what I hope to accomplish and, and really what I'm afraid of. They would have moved on without understanding how much I loved and appreciated them. You know, and I, and I learned through this stretch something that I eventually heard in one of my favorite songs, Mount Joy's Silver Lining, in which he pleads with the listeners to tell the ones you love, you love them. Tell the ones you love, you love them. I hadn't really been living that way up until these two experiences, but I'm trying to live that way now. Now, on a quick sidebar, does, does anybody else have a hard time, particularly the males, does anybody else have a hard time saying, I love you to your dad? Like, maybe it's some artifact from, like, the machismo, you know, way. You don't, it's too macho. You don't say I love you. But anyway, both my brother and my dad are alive and well. Justin, I love you. Dad, I, uh, dad, I, uh, I really, uh, fuck it. Dad, you're cool, and I appreciate everything you've done. So I surprised Jess by proposing to her on December 7th, 2018, outside the Nashville airport, romantic, I know, where I had been the previous day for work and where she had just flown into. So this marks now the, the night before this that she flew in was the second night of the two nights I discussed earlier where we'd been apart. Just a trivial item, but nonetheless. So here's the thing. Not only did I, did I surprise her with a proposal when she landed in Nashville, but also that I had planned our wedding for the next day, assuming she was up for it, of course. And... Making things happen in short order and, and pulling off big plans is something I'd always prided myself on professionally. Uh, and now this was really my first chance to really prove my chops in my personal life. I was ecstatic about it. It was a super fun project. So over the course of like 72 hours, I put together a full wedding for Jessica and I. Now we were eloping, which was something we had discussed. So I knew it was what she preferred. So it really wasn't a risk. And I had a lot of t a help along the way too. You know, people were so moved by the, the thought of a surprise elopement that they were super eager to lend a hand in making shit happen. So I had clerks, store clerks searching around various department stores throughout the greater Nashville area while I was running around town and tying up loose ends. You know, I, I found this awesome private jeweler who hooked me up and worked after hours for us. Um, I, found, I ended up uh, making a donation to a museum that granted us full access to to Nashville's Parthenon, which is a full-scale replica of the ancient site in Greece. I found a florist who was willing to do something real last minute uh, and, and stay after work on Saturday in order to, keep to, to make the timing work. We found an officiant and a photographer on Craigslist. You know, and, and she didn't know all of this yet, uh, but when I, when I proposed and told her the situation, she obliged and it was on. And she was going into a day that she really had no idea what it was going to be. Didn't know what her dress was going to look like. None of that. So Saturday morning, we had to drive to rural Tennessee in order to scoop up a marriage license because that was the closest county that was open on Saturdays. And Jessica, because of a, a legal matter of a, a hearing she was uh, representing a client in, she wasn't able to come until after the county buildings had closed on Friday. So we had about a two-hour drive up to bumfuck, you know, BFE, uh, northern Tennessee. And it was kind of a fun project. Jessica had rollers in her hair still because uh, she wanted to curl her hair. and um, But, you know... Sidebar, right? So, so Jessica looks so beautiful in her dress. Uh, she she had a succulent bouquet, which is her favorite. She's learned, she's really taught me a lot about plants, and she's she's like a plant goddess. Uh, the Parthenon and its giant golden, I mean, like seventy five foot golden Athena statue, served as the backdrop for our ceremony, which was just uh, a handful of people, um, just the people required to to make it happen. From start to finish, the ceremony was probably fifteen minutes. 
And that includes the time that we both blubbered and cried our way through the, the vows that we'd prepared. You know, that, so after the Parthenon, took a few pictures, and just the two of us headed to the famous honky-tonk called Nudie's. It's not a nudie bar, despite the name, but it is, it's a famous honky-tonk on the strip in Broadway in Nashville. And the band there was already prepared to play a song for us, uh, Cover Me Up by Jason Isbell. It's not, not necessarily our song, but certainly appropriate for the occasion and definitely appropriate for the venue. You know, so a couple hundred honky-tonk booze hounds cheered us on as we danced. And uh, after that, we took off. We went to a rooftop bar next where there was a DJ who had been prepared to play a, a Mac Miller and Anderson Pack song for us. So we danced to that. Um, we then had a bite to eat downstairs at that hotel, which was uh, just the two of us. It was, really, it was really chill. It was super nice. And, I, you know, Jessica deserved a wedding that aligned with kind of her vibe and what, what her disposition is. And I think, I think she got that. And it was, to be honest, just one of the best nights ever. Um, and for the first time in my life, I felt so confident that I, ha- that I had found my partner. You know, so comfortable knowing that I could be myself with Jessica without fear of any negative repercussions or judgment. You know, she inspires me to follow my passions, to be creative, even if that means holding myself up and recording podcast audio when I have a lot of other things to do. You know, this part of my life, while I'll have to continue to, to work on with Jessica, it's never going to be easy, but I, I, I'm confident that it's taken care of. I have my person. Okay, and honestly, I would do it all over again, even the bullshit divorces, all of that. I would do it all over again in order to end up here, because really, without those failed relationships, I would have never been ready to truly meet Jessica. You know, I mean, it sounds cliche, but I really don't regret my past. I don't regret anything. It it already happened, first off, so it can't be changed. But more importantly, the experiences have built me into the person I am today. It's really a beautiful thing when, when old cliche platitudes end up proving themselves in real life. Like, like what, doesn't make, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, but it's true. I, I wasn't killed and I'm still here and I am stronger for it. So here we are in early 2019. My mental health has vastly improved. My physical health was too. Jessica and I are as solid as could be. And what I realized next, perhaps another cliche, is that when you've got everything else cleaned up inside yourself, the external issues are magnified and highlighted aggressively. So my professional situation, which had been deteriorating for some time, was becoming almost untenable now. Now that I wasn't dumbed down from hangovers and complacency. You know, my personal politics, my personal ethics, my overall disposition were all being challenged on a daily basis at work. Organizational changes occurred there that resulted in me working up to a leader that I didn't really believe in and really who nobody believed in. And it was becoming clear to me that there was a major fit issue. Likely the whole time, but one that was becoming more and more apparent and very quickly. Meanwhile, back at home, Jessica and I were developing a worldview that was focused heavily on authenticity, thanks in large part to Jessica's influence, right? So as I became more and more concerned with authenticity and therefore became more and more authentic... With, with less concern for what my image might be, the conditions at work were making it such that not only could I not satisfy my professional goals, but I couldn't satisfy my personal goals either. And I voiced some of my concerns about this. And once the top top found out, uh, I was terminated. I mean, look, technically the company and I have mutually agreed to part ways, but put it this way, I didn't call a meeting with HR at Big B fucking Coffee to mutually part ways. Nuh-uh. I was fired. And yes, in a public coffee shop in the same town that 29 company-owned facilities called home. I guess all the conference rooms must have been booked. Okay? My ego took a hit from, from, being, from being fired for sure, but that's fine. And frankly, that's probably healthy. But any sadness I did feel about the sudden change was quickly eliminated by the realization that, holy shit, I was free from this place. And don't get me wrong, there are a lot of good people there, many of whom I still call friends and still communicate with on a regular basis, but that place was killing me, you know? And so really, in cutting me loose, the the company did me a favor. So if you're listening, company, thank you. Sincerely, thank you, company. So that brings us to the era in which we are currently living, and that is, of course, the unemployed Kirk era. Okay, I mean, I stay busy. I help Jessica with her legal work wherever possible, and sometimes that might mean running sentencing guidelines. Other times it might mean just carrying her bag and making sure she understands that she's going to do awesome. You know, she was already a great lawyer on her own, and I think she's going to become even better now that she can really focus on the key items as I can help manage some of the noise. Now, I still talk to some folks in the industry and keep lines open for future work, but I don't really see myself working for anyone ever again. 
You know, not unless I'm intentionally seeking the opportunity to work for someone specifically. And, you know, I've had the pleasure of working for a couple of great managers. And if that opportunity were to present itself again, I would probably take it in a heartbeat. But at the same time, Jessica and I are able to help people and make major impact on people's lives through legal services. And at the same time, we get to spend all of our time together, like 23 to 24 hours a day. Seriously, it's fucking awesome. We bought a 100-year-old house, a house from 1919 that we're renovating and we're trying to, to reuse as many components as we can. So that's been super fun. I get to kind of exercise a little bit of uh, creative uh, design work there. You know, but really with Jessica's encouragement and support, and I mean this in the sincerest way, with her true encouragement and true support, I finally... Uh, taking the initial steps necessary to begin this podcast, A Talk in the Attic. You know, dating back to when I was little, I always felt the urge to public speak, to act, to make jokes. I used to always think and tell everyone that I'd always wanted to be an art architect, but I think that's bullshit. I, I knew that I always wanted to be a comedian. Always. And while many of my favorite podcasters like Mark Maron, Bill Burr, Conan O'Brien started and continue as, as extremely successful comedians, building large followings there before translating their fanhood, their friendship over to a successful podcast, I'm going to start at the latter. I'm starting with the podcast. And what exactly comes with this project is a huge question mark. You know, I, I can think of a, a number of potential possible outcomes ranging from flaming out to, to middling success to even mega stardom, you know, but I'm less concerned with defining this project's goal than I am with the process of building it. You know, and perhaps this is reflective of my advancing worldview, you know, one that de-emphasizes the standard metrics of success and really focuses on learning and being present and trying to make an impact, a positive impact on whoever I can. You know, two or three years ago, I was afraid to start a podcast because what if nobody listens? Now, with Jessica at my side and a little more time on my hands and a disinterest in direct monetary success, it's finally time and I'm fucking jacked about it. I'm super excited about it. And granted, a talk in the attic is still a little nebulous, if you will, but I've got a really good idea as to the direction I'm hoping to take it. And look, a large part of this podcast will be devoted to personal interviews with, with talks from uh, people from all walks of life. You'll hear interviews with everyday folks, friends and neighbors, maybe with rising stars in music and other arts and politicians and athletes and geeks and rich people and poor people. But when we, look at, when we, when we close the book of, of a talk in the attic whenever that might be, I hope that we can leave behind a body of work that helps illustrate that, that once all of the trimmings are stripped away, it, we can learn a few things from one another, right? It, just because Beyonce is the richest person and <laughs> the richest R&B star ever doesn't mean that, you know, what she's gone through can't help you and vice versa. You know, I hope that I'll have formed lasting relationships with, with my guests and with you, the audience. But perhaps most of all, I, I hope to create a space where where anyone can do a little work on themselves just by listening to someone else share the work they've done and the work that they still need to do. And with that, I welcome you to the attic. I appreciate that you listened to this today, and I hope that I get, by giving you a little bit of insight into who I am, you'll maybe, maybe uh, let me know somehow through communication. We'll be on Instagram. We'll have an email address, and I'd really like to form a relationship with the listeners. And um, if there's anything you need to get off your chest, I'm happy to listen. Thanks again, and I look uh, forward to February 28th. Peace!